Hello everybody, Jason here. Alright, so as promised, we've got our ball bounce tutorial starting. Alright, so we're inside After Effects. Okay, I've made a new composition. If I hit Control K, it brings up my comp settings. We can see that I'm sitting at 1920 by 1080. Alright, square pixels, 25 frames a second. I've got it set to 3 seconds currently. I think I'm going to just span that out to 5, just so I've got a little bit of space to work with. Um, Ball Bounce Animation 2, because this is the uh, the second time, hopefully audio actually records, and OK. Alrighty, so, we uh, we know our project panel, we know our workspace, and we know our timeline. Alright, thankfully the Ball Bounce is one of the easier of our assignments, so that's what we get to work on right now. So, I'm just going to make an ellipse, and I'm going to draw it out, and uh, just to save myself the hassle, I'm going to make sure that I don't draw it too large. Alright, I'd like to have it quite small. And I'm um, holding shift to constrain so I get a perfect circle. If I let go of shift and drag it around, I get uh, something that looks a little bit weird, right? So like an oblong or whatever. Um, but the cool thing is that if I then hold down spacebar, which I'm currently doing, and then move my mouse, I can move around the object. So I could just make life a little bit easier by centering it up as best I can over the anchor point. And then I can deselect the layer. All right. I'm going to select my selection tool, shortcut is V, reselect the shape, select my pan behind tool, shortcut is Y, and I'm going to hold down control or command, and I'm going to shift my anchor point to the bottom of the shape. Alright, now we remember the reason why we do that is if I hit S to bring up my scale parameters, unlink it, my height and uh, sort of how tall or short my object is, I want that to be scaling from where my object hits the floor. All right, so I set this up first so that I don't have to try and fix this later. Okay, very important that we try and set it up right the first time around. Okay, so I'm just gonna reset this to 100. And I'm going to work with P, position. All right, I'm just gonna rename this. I can rename it the layer by the right clicking and then uh, the last option for me is rename. Alternatively, I can just select the layer and hit enter. All right, when I hit enter, I can rename it. I'm just gonna call it ball. That way we all know what we're working with. Okay, and I'm gonna block out the positions, right? This just makes my life easier. So at sort of the beginning of my timeline, I want it up here. One second, I'd like it to hit the floor. Okay, uh, two seconds, it's going to bounce upwards. Alrighty, three seconds, it's gonna hit the floor again and four seconds it's gonna sort of balance uh, slightly off the off the ground and five seconds it's gonna land on the ground one last time now if we take a look at the position of these sort of uh, keys over here we can see that it's not hitting the floor consistently all right um, it can be a little bit difficult to eyeball where the floor is going to be which is where we bring in these handy tools called the rulers all right control or command r brings up the rulers or hides them alternatively view show rulers alrighty we also want to make sure that show guides is on so that when we have that I just want to quickly clear my guides uh, if I were to then click and drag I can drag out a line and I can say that that's where I want the floor to be so I can now zoom in and just make sure that these points all touch the floor like so alrighty now, when I'm done with my guide, okay, if I hit Control R or Command R, it hides the rulers, but it doesn't hide the guide. Okay, this doesn't count as a ruler. This is a mark. So, under View, we could either clear them. This deletes it. Uh, lock just means that I can't interact with it. All right, if I were to turn Lock off, I could then shift this guide up and down. Okay, uh, Snap 2 is a very useful tool. You saw that when I was shifting my keys, uh, they sort of like stick to that line. If you play around with that, that's what snapping does. So if I were to turn snapping off, it wouldn't automatically snap to that line. And I could just then uncheck show guides and it's no longer visible. All right, thankfully that line won't ever render. All right, it's just a reference. So even if you leave it on, you don't have to worry about this little blue line being in the end of your video. Okay, so we've got our path. If I were to play this back, we can see that we've got some inconsistencies. All right, most notably the fact that we've got some curves coming out of our contact points. All right, we don't want that. We want it to hit the ground, boom, and leave the ground from the same point that it hits. So, 
Under the pen tool, we have the Convert Vertex tool. So I'm clicking and holding over the pen tool. It brings up Convert Vertex tool over here, and I select that. And all I'm gonna do, you'll notice it doesn't really do much when I'm hovering over null space, but when I hover over an actual key point, I get that little indicator. When I click, it adds or it removes curves. So I'm just going to reset this so that I can see exactly what I'm working with. V to bring up my selection tool. This way I can then space my bounces so that they're exactly in the middle. Um, alrighty, so maybe this bounce moves a little bit far, so we'll have it do that. Okay, I'm holding down shift. By holding down shift, I constrain it to the horizon that I'm moving it along. That stops it from sort of floating around. And I'm fairly happy with that. All right, now I can take my Convert Vertex tool and I can simply click. And if I were to click and drag, it creates a handle for me. And I can use said handles to introduce the arcs that we're looking for in these nice exaggerated bounces. Okay, so now we've got our arcs. And the next thing is that we want to make sure that we can actually get the timing for this right. Now, this is moving very slowly. All right, understandably, we've told it to do everything over the course of a single second, right? So now we are going to be moving up and down our timeline and just repositioning our keyframes. Okay, so we're going to start at the beginning. Now this ball is falling from a great height and it's then hitting the ground. So I would assume that this might take about 15 or 18 frames. Okay, so I could click this little head over here on our time indicator and try and drag and count out 18 frames, but that's not very accurate. Notice that while I do move this head, these numbers rise and fall, right? So that's a frame indicator. So I could click on this little block over here and I could type in 18 and it will take me to frame 18. All right, that's one way of doing it. Alternatively, remember we spoke about using page up and page down, all right? So page down moves us on to the right on the timeline by single frames. Page up moves us to the left, all right? For the Mac users, we hold command and we use the left and right arrow keys, all right? If I hold down shift and hit page down, I jump out by 10 frames, all right? So I could hit shift uh, and page down twice to count 20 frames and then page up twice to get to 18. And I'm just gonna shift my keyframe up. Alrighty, then I might assume that it's going to take just as long for it to sort of reach the apex of this bounce, okay, so it might uh, take another 18 frames to get here, so I'll do the same thing. Shift page down twice, that's 20 frames, page up twice, that's back to 18, and I'll shift my key. Now, the ball has lost energy and momentum, okay, it's not going to be falling from as high, it's not going to be falling as fast. So, uh, it's not going to take as long to hit the ground. Alrighty, so instead of 18, maybe it's only 15. So shift page down once to get 10 frames and then page down five times. One, two, three, four, five. And I can shift this keyframe up. All right, I'll count another 15. Page down and shift. Not now. Thank you, Battle.net. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. And boom. Okay, and then 10 frames on the end. Okay, so now what I've done is I've told it to take a little less time on my bounces. Now it might look a little slow still, so I might want to just fix up these keys. So rather than 18, maybe that's 15, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I can select and move multiple keys as I go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, I'm not going to fast forward this in the edit. If I have to suffer through this, so do you. Um, next one can be 12, so 10, 1, 2. 10, 1, 2. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Just have it hit the ground. Uh, five frames might be a bit too quick, so make it 8. Alrighty. So if I then play that back, boom, boom, boom. Alright, I'm fairly happy with that time. We can always adjust it a little bit later, but for now it's looking okay. The next thing I want to do is just cut out all this dead space. All right, I don't want to have a video that just sort of sits here for three seconds doing nothing. So on the three second mark, because we've got a nice big space between three seconds and where our last frame is, I'm going to hit the button N. All right, N for napalm, or um, perhaps I should just type it out so that you can all see it. Capital N. Okay. Um, 
character show me my character just so that I can scale this up and you can see we hit N big N alrighty now N what that does is it ends my timeline right N for ends I think it should make sense I'm gonna right click on the gray work area trim comp to work area and now we've cut out all that dead space great next thing I'm gonna do click in this gray sort of space in my timeline and drag to select all my keyframes I'm gonna hit F9 all right alternatively right click keyframe assistance easy ease right we want to apply easing and this changes our keys to look like little hourglasses now this is very important okay some of us are forgetting to do this it's getting a little bit frustrating to tell you to do this right it should be second nature by now we add easing to our keyframes to help apply realistic movement the reason why this is important is because when I select a keyframe and jump into my graph editor the only time that we're going to get our little speed bumps is if we've added easing. If I were to turn my keyframes back to our normal keyframes and jump into the graph editor, we get little blocks. All right, this is not conducive to sort of changing the speed of our animation. All right, it doesn't matter where I drag this line back and forth. It does make a little bit of a difference, but it's not going to do much by way of sort of like allowing for smooth animation between our processes. Okay. So we select all our keyframes, F9 to add easing, and now we can play this back and see what it looks like. Okay, so first of all, it's not behaving like a ball would, right? It's not falling. Uh, it's sort of easing into the contact. It's easing out of the contact. We know from experience that when we drop something valuable and that shouldn't be dropped, it picks up speed right up until the point it hits the floor and breaks. And sort of our hearts shatter with it right so we need to emulate that okay so how I go about doing that is I select the key that I want to use jump into my graph editor and I play around here all right now there's a couple of options that we can turn on and off inside the graph editor okay and uh, we should know what these are but first of all let me remind you we have to have a keyframe selected when we go into the graph editor if I don't have anything selected our graph editor will be empty. It doesn't know what we want it to show us. Okay, so if you're jumping into the graph editor and you don't see anything, it's because you haven't selected a key, dummy. So go back, select a key, hit the graph editor button, and now here we are. If I right click in any of the gray space in here, I get this little pop up. Okay, auto zoom is a very helpful feature. What this means is that it will automatically zoom us into our timeline so that it fills the space with our ups and downs. If we had very small movement and the auto zoom was off, it would be a tiny little blip down here somewhere and it would be very difficult to see what we were animating. Okay, show selected properties just means that we've selected position and thus it is showing the selected property being position. Uh, graph editor set, I'm not entirely sure what that does, but I'll just leave it on for the sake of it. And then we've got our sort of, um, important selection over here so we've got the speed graph which is what we're using with our speed bumps all right or we've got the value graph which is slightly terrifying um, it's a little bit more powerful but it's not something that we want to be using at the moment all right so we want to be in edit speed graph okay and we don't move our little yellow squares at all okay these little yellow squares are in fact the keyframes Okay, so if I were to shift this up and down, I'm shifting my keyframe back and forth. I'm breaking the timing that I've just gone and counted the frames out for. We don't want to do that. We want to be using these little yellow dots. Okay. What can sometimes happen is for whatever reason, After Effects might, excuse me, After Effects might select all the keyframes and then any movement we do affects everything. Now, if we're doing a very predictable animation, this might work, but we're not. All right, so if this happens, just click away and then reselect a key and we can continue from there. Alrighty. So what we want is we want our object to move fairly slowly in the beginning, pick up speed and then hit the ground at a, a little bit of a pace. All right. So what I do is I just shift it up. We remember in our graph editor that we see this little number zero and then we see sort of these bigger numbers moving upwards. These represent the amount of change. Okay, we start off with zero change taking place, and as we progress, slowly more and more change is taking place until, boom, we get to this point, and then the most change is taking place. Notice how that as I scrub over these two frames, our ball is jumping a distance from here to here. Okay, it's a pretty big jump. And then it hits the ground. Bang! 
We also then want it to leave the ground at the same speed that it hits, all right? That kinetic energy is being transferred. The ball is moving upwards, all right? That's what a bounce is. So we want the same sort of curve over here, but in the opposite direction. So I drag this one in like so, and this one like so. So if I then preview that, we've got a fairly nice little bounce taking place. Okay, boom. Now, because we've made this arch, what this effectively means is that it's slowing down as it reaches the top of this arc. Okay, and this actually does take place in real life. It's very interesting, right? So our ball has enough kinetic energy to bounce off the ground here, but as it's moving, it is fighting against wind resistance and gravity. And eventually, momentum will run out, it will run out of energy, and gravity will take over. All right, it's a slow process in the exaggerated bounce. So it makes sense to ease into that arc. And then it would ease out of that arc and speed up to hit the ground afterwards. So we would then drag this out like so. Okay, into the next bounce. Boom, it hits the ground. It needs to leave the ground at the same speed. All right, so we wanna make that leave fairly quickly. And then it's gonna reach the top of this arc and ease out of it and slam it to the ground at the end. Okay, so if I play this back, we've got a fairly interesting thing, right? So it's a lot better than it was before. However, we're getting that dreadful hang at the top of our arcs that a lot of us are struggling with, okay? And there is a way to fix it, thankfully. All right, so the way to fix that is I'm going to identify where the hang is taking place. It's taking place over here and over here. Okay, so what I need to do is I'll drag my time indicator to that point and I'm going to click this little mountain or click and drag this little slider to zoom in just so I can see what I'm working with a little bit better. All right, and I'm just going to select the keyframe that's here. Now, if we take a look at what this keyframe is sitting on, it's sitting on the zero indicator. So what's happening in this little section is the computer is being told to take the energy or the movement all the way to zero and then from zero up to the actual motion. Okay, and that's what's causing that little like hang in midair, which is very noticeable. So what we're gonna do is I'm going to select this keyframe. I'm going to click, I'm gonna hold shift and I'm going to drag it upwards. Just notice how I'm moving that keyframe upwards a little bit. Okay, so I'm just gonna move it up a little bit and then we don't wanna leave this keyframe behind. We want it to be with its buddy and we're gonna drag it up as well. So what we've effectively told it now is that when it gets to the least amount of motion taking place, it shouldn't come to a complete stop. It should still continue moving um, over a little bit. Okay, so if I were to then play that back, there we go. Simply by dragging that key up, we no longer have the little hang, it continues moving. Now I may have been um, a little overzealous with that movement, so maybe I can bring it down just a little bit, down just a little bit. We still want the idea that it's fighting gravity and hanging in mid-air. Okay, so I'm just gonna play that back. Boom, boom. Okay, we need to do the same thing over here. So I'm just gonna zoom all the way in, select this, drag it up a little bit, drag it up a little bit and play it back. All right, so this is the process where we are constantly just playing back to see if what we've done is working. All right, there's no sort of harm in constantly checking that our animation is actually working. Okay, one more time. I think for the purpose of this tutorial, that's working quite well. Okay, so we've fixed the hang by bringing that little key or the little keys over there up on our timeline so that there's constant movement. All right, and we are done with the graph editor for the position. Okay, we have finished that. Now we can add squash and stretch. All right, which is the fun part. So, selecting my ball, I'm gonna hold Shift and S, I'm gonna hit S, brings up my scale, and I'm going to create a keyframe for that. Alrighty, I'm going to right click on that frame and I'm gonna to say toggle hold keyframe. And this is just so that I don't get confused by a constantly scaling ball. I wanna block out my animation. Okay, when it hits the ground, I know for a fact that I want it to squash out a little bit, um, depending on how rubbery or sort of um, hard I, or like malleable I want this object to be, it's gonna squash and stretch uh, to varying degrees. So I'm thinking that if we sort of stretch it out to about here, maybe 120, all right, 
we've sort of squashed it out, but we're not maintaining our volume, right? This ball has grown in size, if we take a look. Okay, so what I've added to the width, I need to subtract from the height so that it always adds up. Mathematically, if we can keep it correct, we maintain the volume, and that is a very visible process. So I took 20 and added it to the width. I need to subtract it from the height, so it's gonna be 120, 80. Now, if we take a look at that, we can see that this ball is the same size, but is in a different sort of shape. Okay, so we've now blocked out the squash. At the top of the bounce, it's gonna be a perfect circle again. I don't need to try and remember what these numbers were. I can simply select my key from the beginning where it is a perfect circle. Alrighty, drag myself back out to where it's gonna be a perfect circle here. Control or Command C to copy that frame and then Command or Control V to paste it. All right, and now I'm just working smart and not hard. When it hits the ground, it's gonna squash again. So control C, control V to paste that, but it's not gonna squash as much, right? It's not falling as fast or from as high off the ground. So I can copy this frame across to over here just to get like my basic maths down, but then I can change the value. So instead of 120, 80, I'm gonna make this 110 and 90. And now it's not squashing as much. It's then going to reach the top of its arc over here, so I can simply copy paste my first keyframe again, where it's a perfect circle. And on the very end, I'm going to copy paste my squash. We need to remember to add squash on our final impact. All right. If we've added squash up until this point, and then we forget to add it on the end, it's very visible. It looks like the character has died in midair. All right, but the squash is not gonna be anywhere near as big. So instead of 110 and 90, I'm just gonna make it 105 and 95. And then I'm gonna count out one, two, three frames, and we can make it a perfect circle again. And that just gives us a nice little blip at the end. Okay, now I can select all these keyframes, and I can hit F9 to add easing, and I can play it back and see what's happening. Okay, it's looking a little bit more interesting, but it's not behaving as a ball would just yet. As you can see, my ball is currently squashing down before it hits the floor, which would not happen. Okay, there's nothing sort of acting upon this ball to cause it to take this shape just yet. So, I'm gonna go to where I've keyed out the squash, and I'm gonna hit page up twice, one, two, right? That's command with the left arrow key, one, two, for those of you on a Mac. Okay, and I am going to copy paste this keyframe. Control C, Control V, Command C, Command V. All right, whenever I say Control, you little Mac users, it's Command. All righty. Now, I'm going to swap the values because what's actually happening here is as the ball is getting speed, we're exaggerating a cartoon bounce, this ball is in our mind's eye going to get taller. It's gonna stretch out before it hits the ground. So I'm just gonna swap these values around. We'll make this 80 and we'll make this 120. Okay. Hits the ground, boom. Two frames later, I can simply copy paste this key. It stretches up again, and then it becomes a perfect circle. Hits the ground, two frames beforehand, I'm gonna copy paste this key, and I'm gonna swap the values, 90 and 110. Two frames afterwards, 90 and 110. Alrighty, and we can be a little bit more lazy towards the end over here, all right? So what we've done at the very end, because it's falling from such a low height, uh, it's technically just a little bubble, like a, a little blip on the end. We don't need to add a stretch to this, okay? But we do need to then adjust the timing so that we don't have it um, turning into uh, a squashed object before it hits the ground. So we can get to that when we jump into the graph editor. But if I were to play this back, Already we've got a better idea of what's actually happening with this ball. We're starting to get to that. Okay, so now we're going to select one of our scale frames and we're gonna jump into the graph editor. Now the graph editor for scale is a little bit more scary than position. And the only reason for that is because scale has got two values to work with. It's got width and it's got height, right? So it needs to represent those two values with a green line and a red line so that we can tell the difference. The only thing that we need to do for this exercise though, zoom in, drag myself over so I can see what I'm working with, and we just need to work with this little um, frame over here and this little frame over here for now. If I drag through, this squash is taking, or stretch rather, is taking, uh, it, it's happening too soon. 
right? It's beginning to deform, but it's not moving fast enough, right? It's not believable that it's picked up enough speed for that change to occur just yet. We actually want that change to happen about here at the, at the very soonest, okay? And I'm just basing that off of uh, visually gauging the size difference between these interpolation points in our visual view over here. So all I need to do, select one of these frames, click on the little yellow circle and drag it out. Okay, notice that I can drag this up and down. Now, as I do this, you'll see that it's changing the size of my ball. We don't want that to happen. We wanna make sure that we just keep it on this thick black line that's being used as reference. We'll do the same thing with the green. And there we go. I can even drag this a little bit further backwards. Like so. And if I scrub through this now, perfect circle, slowly easing into a transformed circle until it hits the ground, boom. We don't need to worry about this little transition. It actually helps um, break the sudden shock of the squash. So having that little transition there is actually quite useful. Okay, and then I can hold down spacebar to get my little hand tool and I can drag myself along the timeline here or I could use this little slider to move myself. Okay, and what we're seeing over here is the auto zoom taking place, right? So these arcs over here are automatically zooming to fill up the space as we get rid of these arcs here. So if your thing is constantly morphing and changing like a bad acid trip, don't freak out, it's meant to do that. Okay, so now we're having the same thing. Okay, this ball needs to have most of its change from a sort of oblong circle to a perfect circle. It needs to happen in this space, right? Because this is where most of the speed is occurring. And all that means is that we drag these little circles in a little bit on this side and all the way out on this side over here. Okay, so if I scrub through, most of my change is taking place. In fact, I would even expand this a little bit further. So most of our change is taking place over here. And then it's almost a perfect circle before it even gets to the top of the arc, right? That helps to sell the idea that we've lost energy, right? It's slowing down as it goes. Then, the same thing that we did at the very beginning. We don't want our change occurring too soon. We want it happening sort of here at the bottom of our arc. So we're just going to drag that out. All right, it's as simple as that. Now the graph editor can be very confusing. Uh, you really shouldn't feel bad if it takes you a little while to get used to it. Myself, I only got used to the graph editor in my third year. All right, something that I avoided like the plague, but I regret that because my animations while I was studying could have been so much better had I actually taken the time to practice. All right, and that's all it comes down to, it's practicing. Okay, so we have that transformation taking place. Uh, we've got a, a weird little blip over here that I want to try and just make sure that that's not going to uh, cause any serious issues. So let's just get them all lined up over there. Okay. Alrighty, so then we want the same thing, right? We want most of our change to be occurring here at the beginning. Uh, pull it this way. Okay, perfect circle. Now, if you remember, we didn't add a stretch, a tall portion of the circle before this impact. All right. The reason being that it wasn't really falling high enough in order to warrant it. But what's currently happening is that we are easing into that squash a little bit too soon. So we do need to still remember to just affect this so that it only really takes place at the very end as it hits the ground. Okay, boom. All right, that's looking pretty good. Okay, so leaving the scary graph editor, we can zoom out and we can see what we're looking at. Okay, this is actually looking pretty decent for the first run. It hangs a little bit long at the end, so I could always jump back into my graph editor there, lift those keyframes a little bit higher, perhaps shift the keyframes a little bit closer. If I take a look at this, maybe what's happening here is that this is 10, that's 12 frames. Maybe it's hanging in air too long. Maybe instead of 12 frames, I should make it the same number as this one here. That was eight, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Select these keys and shift them up. Maybe this will help sell the idea a little bit more. Boom, boom, boom. All right. One, um, 
point two. Let's drag that out a little bit more. Ten to eight. Ah, that's looking pretty good. All right. Now, okay, so we've done the animation. This is the part where we save. Okay, so Control Shift S, save as to wherever you want to save, just in case Telcom decides to strike. And then we can add our finishing touches. Now, the thing is, right, we're not just animators. Okay, we're not just 3D animators. We don't just get marks for having the principle um, sort of being animated correctly. Okay, we're motion designers. We need to make shit look good. All right, at the moment, I've got a little blue ball bouncing in the void of space. Now, it might be a little bit of a commentary on existential crisis, but it doesn't look great, okay? The other thing that doesn't look great, if I bring my rulers back out, Control or Command R, is the fact that our ball starts here, right, with that much space on the left-hand side, and it ends here. Look at all this dead space, right? We want to center this ball. How would I go about doing that? I can't move it because that's going to add another keyframe. It's going to break the animation that I've made. All right. So what I can do, so I'm going to hit view. I'm just going to clear my guides. I don't need them anymore. I am going to click on this little button over here next to my zoom percentage. It's called the choose grid and guide options. And I'm going to select the first option, title action safe. And this gives me an action safe for when I'm working with television. All right. So this can be a very useful tool. Um, we know for a fact that everything in this middle box will be on TV, uh, pretty much up to this border over here will be on screen. Anything outside of this border has a risk of being cut off. So as a general rule, we kind of want to keep our animation within these outer lines. Okay, so the way that we can do that, right? So we're inside the line, but it, do, it ends quite far away from the other line on the other side. I'm going to go to layer, new, null object. Alrighty, and we get this little red square, which I can click and move around. But for the red square, I need to make sure to click and drag on its anchor point, because if I drag anywhere else, I scale it. All right, so if I try and drag, okay, I can click in the middle and drag. I actually didn't know that. Cool, the more you know. So I'm just gonna position that inside of my circle, like so. And I'm then going to parent, right? So I parent by clicking on my little pick whip tool and dragging over to the null. Now, wherever I move my null, so I'm going to hold down shift and use my arrow keys, I am going to move not only the shape, but all of its keyframe information. Notice how that as I'm moving this, it's not changing my animation. All right, so a null is a very powerful tool to just help you align things after we've done our animation. Perhaps we didn't think about it clearly enough at the very beginning. So this gives us our opportunity to reposition it towards the end. Now this is looking a little bit better. All right, so we're starting up there. Let's drag it a little bit more this way. And then, nope, still not touching the edge. So perhaps there. And this might seem tedious, this might seem silly, but trust me, this is where we start getting our little extra marks, is having our things centered, right? So properly aligned, that's looking a lot better in terms of visual weight, it's using up the center of the screen now. Okay, now that I've gone in the right position, I can delete the null, I no longer need it. Deleting the null is not going to affect it, it's gonna unparent our object, so life is good. Now, we don't want this object just bouncing in black space. Okay, but we also don't want to give it a very garish background. We don't have to put a lot of effort into our background. What we can do is we can go up to layer, new, and then we can select solid. All right, shortcut for this is control Y. And when we select this, we get a little solid setting box. All right, now it will automatically be set to the size of your workspace. Okay, so don't change these numbers, they're fine. We can change our color, however, and we get this little color picker tool over here. So I can click this and whatever I hover over, it's going to then select that as a possible option to change my color to. So I'm just gonna hover over my ball just to get an initial blue. And I'm gonna just then use this color picker to make it slightly darker like so. And I'm gonna say, okay. And then I say, okay, a second time and it makes a layer. That layer is currently on top of the hierarchy. So if I drag that down underneath, there it is. All right. I think I should have made this blue a little bit darker. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit Control or Command if you're on a Mac. So Control, Shift, Y. That brings up the options for that solid again. And I can jump back into this color picker and just make it a little bit darker. Notice how it then updates in the background. 
All right, so I'm thinking about there, looks good. Say okay. All right, so now we've got a background that is complementing our ball, but it's bouncing. So we should also just give it a floor, right? We could complete this stage for it. So I'm going to select my solid, which is now being labeled deep blue, deep royal blue solid four. I'm going to hit control or command D to duplicate that layer. All right. And then this layer that's on top, control or command shift Y so I can access the color changes again. And I'm going to make it even darker. I'm going to say OK to that. And now I can move that down just to make a very simple floor. Okay. If I then hide my title action safe and play this animation back, notice that now we're just looking at something slightly more appealing, right? We don't mind looking at this as much as we did a ball bouncing in black space. Motion design, we make things that look good move well. Okay, so we can get a little bit of extra marks. If the animation's looking great, but there's something missing, Having a complementing background might be what you need to carry you up to that one extra mark. All right, and seeing as the marks are the things you guys seem to be so inherently worried about, uh, that's a tip that you can take home with you. All right, so that is it for our bouncing ball animation. Okay, we've covered working with uh, creating the shape, blocking out the actual animation, blocking out the scaling for the animation, working with the easing and the graph editor, and then making a bit of a background for it. Okay, the next thing that we want to do is we want to render this out. Okay, so we want to save it. Control Shift S or Control S to save. Okay, um, this is the part where you refer back to the uh, rendering from Media Encoder tutorial that I recorded for you guys. Alternatively, Composition, Add to Render Queue, right? Or File, Export, Add to Render Queue. We add it down here. Best settings, as long as that sets to best, that's okay. Lossless, we never render lossless, right? We only render QuickTime. H.264 if you can. Alternatively, animation if you cannot. But remember, in the tutorial for rendering in um, Media Encoder, you will have the H.264 option. All right, so we no longer have an excuse to be rendering large size videos. We say okay, we tell it where we want this to be rendered to, and we say save and we hit render, and that will then render out for us with a nice little bell at the end. Alrighty, so that is our first tutorial on the bouncing ball exercise. Coming up next will be your animation of the ball and tail, and then the dreaded walk cycle. So I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye. Postscript, completely forgot to show you guys the whole addition of sound thing to this bounce, right? Because that is a, a, a requisite. All right, so when working with audio, we import it, right? So we double click, we sort of drag it in. Um, I already have, right? Here's my audio file <coughs> over here. And um, what we then do is we, we drag that down and... Um, some of you made the mistake of, of sort of having it at the top and then we see that picture, right? So we wanna, we wanna turn that off. So we turn the eye off to hide the image. We can drag this down to the bottom to make life easy. Okay, so a couple of ways that we can work with this audio layer. All right, the first one we can do is we can hit the little drop down and then under audio waveform, right? We can see where the actual bounces are taking place. And when I play that back, we get the actual sound. If you can see your audio, you'll see the, the spike in your actual audio over there. Okay. Now, we don't want the audio in this case to drive our animation. All right. We've done the animation. We now want the audio to match that. Okay. So now I need to cut this audio. Now, how I go about doing that, I've decided uh, of all the bounces in this audio clip that I like the first one. All right. It's the easiest one to find. So, there's a couple of ways I could go about this, but the easiest way is if I hold down Alt. Okay, so I'm holding down the Alt modifier key, and then I'm going to be using my open and close square bracket keys. Now this is available on all keyboards, including Macs. All right, so Alt open square bracket, the one that's on the left, will automatically cut and delete the sort of opening section of the audio that I don't need. Okay, I'm gonna drag myself 
um, sort of over here where the audio seems to fade and then alt closing square bracket the one on the right is going to delete everything else that I don't need and I can play this back and I can see that this is actually where my sound is taking place so I could probably get away with dragging this in a little bit like so and we'll still get the sound of the bounce now I might have cut it a little bit too soon so I can always drag this back out there we go now we've got our nice bounce sound taking place and we need to align this sound right so I can move this layer up Okay, this is where our bounce is taking place. So, if I play this back, that seems to work. Perhaps one layer more. There we go. Okay, that's selling the idea that it's causing the sound as it hits the ground. Okay, then we need to duplicate this layer and align it to this contact. So I'm gonna select my layer, Control or Command D to duplicate it. Now, if I don't want to sort of hit the little drop down and go into audio, I can also select my layer and hit the letter L for Lima twice. One, two, right, quite quickly. And it will automatically bring up the waveform for me. And I can see where I want that to be. So I can just drag that over there. Make sure it's working. Okay, and then it hits the ground one last time. So Control or Command D, LL to see the waveform. Drag it out one more time and Bob's your uncle we've got audio okay so now if I wanted to edit this audio okay because now it makes sense that it would be this loud on the first impact because it's hitting the ground quite hard but the second impact it's not going to hit as hard so we kind of want to just bring this volume down a little bit so what I'm going to do is I'm working with this layer over here and I'm going to hit this little drop down uh, sorry this drop down and this drop down to the transform option um, and under audio we've got our audio levels okay and all I'm gonna do is just drag this down to about a negative 8 now it's a little bit softer alright so we've got a loud bounce slightly softer bounce and then on the last one it's gonna be even softer than that so I kinda just wanna hit that little drop down audio levels and I can type in a value the last one was minus 8 I'm gonna make this one negative 15 there we go and that's how we work with our audio. Okay, so hopefully that has answered your questions about that. Alrighty, save, render, and that's what we get. Alrighty, check you guys in the next one. Bye.